John chapter 20, beginning in verse 30. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the word of God. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's pray. Our great God, how you have revealed yourself through the pages of Scripture as well as nature. You have given yourself and revealed yourself a self-disclosure. And we would pray that you would open up our eyes to see what you have revealed. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I once heard a Jewish man tell the story of a Jewish man who was uh, an owner of a small family business in New York City. It's a family business, a family store, one that had been handed down to him from at least two generations, his father before him and his father's father. Over time, a number of buildings and stores were bought up around him by wealthy owners. Yet he stood his ground and he kept his for his uh, small family business operating. Eventually, two huge mega stores were built either side of his store. So you can imagine, there's like a Costco on one side and a Walgreens on the other. And his tiny store was in the middle. And it signaled the end of his business. He knew it. He knew his little store couldn't compete with both the inventory and the prices of the mega stores. All looked lost until... The store owner came up with an idea, in fact, a master plan. He got up one morning before the sun rose and climbing a ladder, he painted over the name of his store with white paint. He'd come up with a new name for his store that he believed would bring people in and remove the threat of closure. Once the white paint had dried, he used black paint to reveal the new name of his store in huge, bold letters. The new name, Entrance. (laughs) Signs are important, and we'll come back to that. Thomas's confession in the passage previous was just to highlight the climax of where John is taking us in the gospel, so that we would, with Thomas, be able to say, my Lord and my God. Disbelieving Thomas as he was in his refusal to believe unless he saw, unless he felt. This was the climax, the mountain peak. John has sought to bring all of the readers up the mountain of God's truth to see the uniqueness and the supremacy of Christ. My Lord and my God. The Lordship and the full deity of Christ. As we look at that previous passage just to highlight One thing there is the fact that John did not include in his gospel any of the Beatitudes we read of in, uh, say, Matthew's gospel, the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are these, blessed are those. None of that is found in John's gospel, except I do believe we have a Beatitude here at the end of verse 29. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen, seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Speaking of eternal happiness, the benefits of salvation, that's the blessedness that he is speaking of. And faith, as we saw in Hebrews 11 verse 1 from the Amplified Bible last time, it says that faith perceives as real fact what is not perceived, what is not revealed to the senses. Faith grasps hold of realities beyond the senses. And Paul, uh, Thomas here was able to confess Christ. We are not in the immediate presence of Christ as Thomas was to actually see him at this moment. But when he is absent from view, the Holy Spirit causes us to believe in him and we're blessed because of it. When he's absent from view, blessed are those who haven't seen and yet have believed. 1 Peter 1 verse 8 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. 
Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Thomas went on after this event, which was a bad week for him, but he went on to pay the ultimate sacrifice in India, a martyr for the resurrected Savior. I shared last time about preaching in a church in India, the church of Matama, that traces its, its roots historically to be founded by the Apostle Thomas. Now, John is called the evangelist, as the others are, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the four evangelists. John is called the evangelist for a reason. Evangelism includes witnessing, sharing our faith, preaching, many different things, but it also includes writing. And John the evangelist writes for a reason, and that's what's brought out in these verses, verses 30 and 31. John has been a witness. John's been a faithful witness. He writes with intentionality. He's writing on purpose. And he's saying in so many words in these verses before us, I'm writing as an evangelist. There's news to tell. There's good news to tell. News I have to tell. Not everyone is called to be an evangelist with a capital E. Uh, in terms of the office of ministry, but I believe all of us are called to propagate the gospel and fund those who go out with the gospel. C.H. Spurgeon said it this way, every Christian here is either a missionary or an imposter. Strong words. Not everyone's called to go to a different country to proclaim the gospel. In fact, we could stay in the greater Phoenix area and talk to people from many different nations. Isn't that the case? But all Christians should have a missionary mindset, a missionary instinct. We want to get the good news to people. And John writes with that missionary heart. He says, I'm writing for a purpose. Look in verse 30 with me, if you will. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. We'll stop there for a moment. John is telling us that rather than seeking to catalog all he could remember about Jesus, all that he remembers Jesus doing, all that he remembers Jesus saying, he says, this is not an exhaustive list of all he said and did. We, the disciples who were around Jesus, saw him do a whole lot more. But the things written here are intentionally selective. They're serving a purpose, and John writes for that purpose. We realize in Scripture, because there's a human author and a divine author, that the human author might intend one thing, and God, the divine author, might include that thing and something else as well. And here in the account of John, we have what I believe is John's intent in writing. And God, in fact, wanted us to have these words, and He wanted us to have this gospel in our possession. As we look at the text, it's important to understand that whereas others may record what Jesus did as miracles, John calls them signs. Signs. Signs signify something. Do you hear the first four letters of the word signify, sign? They point to a greater reality. See the sign, but don't be so enacted and so enamored by the sign that you meet, fail to see the significance of what it is pointing to. See the significance of each sign, the significance. Signs are not the goal. Signs point you and I to the goal. The sign directs us to something other than itself. Let me say that again. A sign directs us to something other than itself. Entrance. <laughs> Imagine a baseball supporter, specifically a supporter of the Chicago Cubs, someone who's been uh, rooting for that team all uh, their life, and for the first time they visit Chicago, and they see for the first time in real life the sign that says Chicago Cubs Stadium. But instead of seeking entry to the game, the man stops and takes photos next to the sign and goes no further. Wouldn't you say with me, he's missed the point. A sign directs us to something other than itself. And John wants us inside the stadium, so to speak. He wants us enthralled with the sights and sounds of the game. He wants to tell us about the miracles, but he calls them signs because he wants us to see they point to something other than the sign itself. 
We need to see beyond the miracles to see the person of Jesus Christ, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. He's God in the flesh. And that's brought out even in the first chapter of John. He also wants us to understand that Greek word, tetelestai. In English, it is finished. The work that Jesus did on the cross. I want to ask you, have you looked beyond the mighty miracles we've encountered in the Gospel of John and discovered what they point to? The good news is a person, Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done. John lists seven signs. We could list them. Changing water into wine at Cana in Galilee, John chapter 2. Healing the nobleman's son in Capernaum, John chapter 4. Healing the paralytic at Bethesda, John chapter 5. Feeding the 5,000, John chapter 6. Walking on water, John chapter 6. Healing the man blind from birth, John chapter 9. And the raising of Lazarus in John chapter 11. Let me read. In fact, let's go there. John chapter 2. I'd like us to see John's commentary after the first sign. It's interesting to see his words because there's a total consistency throughout. John chapter 2. Look at this in verse 11. This was after turning the water into wine. John 2, 11. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now we could add to this list of signs, his resurrection appearances. We could add to this list what we're about to encounter in John chapter 21, the large hall of fish. But John's convinced that we have enough material by the end of chapter 20 to be convinced he's the Christ, the Son of God. Psalm 103, which was read earlier in the service, verse 7 says this, He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. In other words, the people of Israel saw God's mighty works, but Moses knew his ways. I trust there is something in you that also desires to look beyond seeing what God does to see the God behind the works he does. Verse 30, now Jesus, this is John 20, verse 30, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. He's saying, I'm being selective. Verse 31, but these are written so that you may believe. That's his intent. That's John's purpose. No, Though everything that could be written has not been written, what has been written is sufficient to bring us to faith. Man is left with no excuse for his unbelief. Faith and belief are synonymous terms. We believe and we have faith. And we're called upon not to believe in something in general, but in someone in particular, the person of Christ. When we come to the subject of faith in our Bibles, it's not something that's fuzzy or uh, generic or put in general terms. It's very specific. We are to believe something about someone. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 21, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. You remember in John chapter 1, we read these words. He, Jesus, came to his own and his own people did not receive him, but To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In other words, if you see someone believing in the name of Jesus, God's been at work. He's the one who's the root of that faith, the source of that faith. He's been at work in the human heart, bringing that heart to faith in Christ. Faith is called the gift of God, Ephesians 2. 8 and 9. Uh, Philippians 1, 29, it's been given you to believe. And faith is a key theme. Belief is a key theme in the Gospel of John, highlighted in the most famous verse in our Bibles, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I would just encourage you, if you believe in Christ, believe on Believe on, continue believe, continue to believe. True saving faith is a faith that endures. That's its very nature. 
And that's how we can tell whether someone has true faith or not. Do they continue? Do they continue to believe? The shield of faith that's outlined in Ephesians 6 is God's gift to the believer, part of the armor of God. And its nature is, now hear this, enduring delight and trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's not flawless. We see it in the life of Peter who denied Christ but came back. There are highs and lows. There are peaks and there are valleys. But someone who abandons the faith so that they actually renounce the faith, John, the same gospel writer, commentates on that in chapter 2 of his epistle, 1 John 2, 19, by saying they were never truly of us. They were looking like they were the real deal. They sang the songs. They were there for quite a while. They were part of the missionary apostolic team, but now they're not only not with us, they're not at some denominational church down the road. They have renounced the faith, and they were not truly of us. They looked like it. Weeds grow up. Tears grow up with the wheat, but not everything is wheat. So let's continue reading. But these are written so that you may believe what specifically? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. As you might expect, these words are a mouthful, and they are loaded. John refers to himself so very little in his gospel. He's present. He's present at the scenes that we're reading of, but he's not the one in focus. He calls himself the the disciple whom Jesus loved. He's the one who leant on the breast of Jesus. He, He doesn't say, that was me. Hey, hey, that was me. No, it's John who tells us that, uh, putting the words in the mouth of John the Baptist, he must increase, I must decrease. And although John certainly said that, I would say John the Gospel writer certainly lived that. Jesus is unique. By the way, just as a term, there's no such thing as something being very unique. It's either unique or it's not unique. Unique means one of a kind. You can't have something that's very one of a kind. It's either unique or it isn't. But Jesus is unique. He's the only Son of God. He's supreme. And He demands our full allegiance. What does John call us to? Faith in Jesus as the Christ. Christ is a title rather than a last name. Jesus was not born to Joseph and Mary Christ. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. Christ is a word we get from the Greek Christos, which corresponds to the Hebrew word Mashiach, which means Messiah, means the anointed one. And it is the portrayal of the long-awaited Messiah. When we say Jesus Christ, we're saying Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah. It's, It's amazing to me how... Religious people who get on uh, television with a dog collar on the wrong way round and they look like they've got authority. They say things, usually with an English accent. Have you noticed? Always be suspicious of someone with an English accent. They say something like, well, uh, Jesus, uh, I wouldn't say he's Messiah because I would not want to offend the Jews. Do you know, truth is offensive. Get off my television, please. Just go away. Uh, You can't get past the first verse in our Bible without being offensive. In the beginning, some people don't believe there was one. God, some people don't believe in that. That's offensive. Created, some people don't believe He created. The heavens and the earth, some people don't believe we're here. (laughs) You can't get past the fact that truth will offend. We're not to be offensive in the way we say it, but we're not to hold back on saying it. And I want to proclaim Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. I'm in the kingdom of God because a Jew died for me. The long-awaited Messiah. He is the one pictured in the Old Testament as one who sits on God's throne, who subdues God's enemies. Judas Iscariot was one who thought that Jesus came on his first mission to overthrow the Rome uh, army and was disillusioned when he didn't go about doing that. When he entered into Jerusalem, rather than going one way and uh, taking on the civil government of Rome, he went another way into the temple and cleansed it. And that was the end for Judas. 
Instead of whipping Romans, he whipped Jews. That was it. And so there's this expectation he would overthrow all of God's enemies. But Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. We find that in John chapter 18. He came on a mission because our greatest enemy was not the oppressors of government. Hear this. The greatest oppression is not that which is of human origin. It's sin. It's Satan. It's death. It's all of the things that are the result of the curse of God. And Jesus came on a mission to rid us of all oppression as the Prince of Peace. And when He comes back, His rule will be seen. He is ruling now. He is the Messiah. He is the one that the Jews are looking for, whether they realize it or not. And in his resurrection appearances, he was going through the, uh, the scriptures, both with the two on the road to Emmaus, but the book of Acts tells us he, he appeared for a period of 40 days to teach them concerning the kingdom of God, opening up the scriptures so that they might understand. And I'm sure that formed the basis for much of the preaching of the book of Acts as the apostles got up and preached what Jesus had revealed. He is the Christ, next phrase, the Son of God. Not a Son of God, the Son of God. He's the eternal Son of God. This is a title of deity. At Christmas time, the uh, Isaiah passage is often portrayed, rightly so. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. I notice the precise language of Scripture there. The child speaks of his humanity. The son speaks of his divinity. The child was born, speaking of human flesh. The son was given. He never had a start date. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, speaking of deity. Everlasting Father, or source of everlasting life, Prince of Peace, of the increase of His government and peace there will be no end, on the throne of David and over His kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. There might be oppression, God will do it. There might be opposition, God will do it. Yahweh Himself, the zeal, the passion of Yahweh will accomplish this. He says, I will set my son on my throne, on the throne of David. He did it. Unto Jesus has been given the name above every name because He humbled Himself even to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted Him and given Him the name that is above every name. And I believe it's speaking there of the title as Lord. As we go on in our text, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Life in His name is John's reference to salvation, eternal life. This is made clear in such passages as John 3 which speaks of the love of God, but also speaks of the wrath of God. Beware of preachers and teachers that will only emphasize one or the other. What is a hellfire and brimstone preacher? Steve Lawson says, someone who preaches the Bible. Who is someone who preaches the love of God? Someone who preaches the Bible. We don't choose and say, well, I prefer this to the other. No. In the plan of God... In His love, He sent His Son to deliver people, because of His love, from His wrath. It's God's own wrath that Jesus came to deliver people from. Not the devil's, God's. He is to be feared. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, our Bible tells us, and that's New Testament. He's not a kinder God who's learnt as He's gone on. You know, I've learnt from my mistakes of the past, this flood thing. I got over that. I was a young God then. No, He's the same God. I am the Lord. I change not. But God in His love sent His Son, God, to save us from God. 
Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, John 3, 36. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. And there's this word we need to hear, and the people of our world needs to hear. Unless you come to Jesus Christ, God's wrath remains on you. Unless you obey the Son, believe Him, come unto Him as Lord. It should not be a challenge to us to say, come to Christ on His terms as Lord. You can't compartmentalize Jesus and say, I'll have Him as Savior. One day I might have Him as Lord. No, Romans 10 verse 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. He is Lord. Steve Lawson again says something like this, paraphrasing. If I stood at the door of your house, rang the bell, and you invited me in, you could not say to me, bring in Steve, but can you leave Lawson outside? So it is. We can't receive him as Savior and say, I'll wait for his Lordship for another time. I'll, I'll kind of think on that. He is Lord. He is Lord and Savior. My Lord and my God was Thomas's confession. Salvation is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his full name and full title, Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is by the grace of God alone, received through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Peter, who's going to appear in this passage in chapter 21 onwards, which is almost like an epilogue, the Crescendo, the climax is here, I think, in chapter 20 with Thomas's confession and then the explanation of the purpose of the book and then the commissioning of the disciples in chapter 21 is almost an epilogue. There's more to it than that, but it certainly is that. But Peter gets up in Acts chapter 4 and he says this, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Have you realized, Christian, the gospel is not only for the unsaved, but for the saved too. The gospel is for Christians. The message of the Bible is both law and gospel. For many in our land, it's law and gospel and then law. I was talking with fellow elder Doug, and he said, it's interesting, we can hear a great gospel message, but as soon as we go to the Lord's Supper afterwards, people get all internal on us and look inside and think, well, have I done enough to qualify for the Lord's Supper? And we become uh, the, these kind of schizophrenic people that, well, one day, we're one moment we're rejoicing in the gospel, and then the other time we think, I don't know if I qualify. No, he qualified us. That's the gospel. We are lawbreakers, and Jesus died for lawbreakers. That's the good news. So the message of the Bible is law and gospel, period. <laughs> the law always challenges us, shows us our faults. You can hear a message on time management based on Ephesians. Make the most of your time for the days are evil. And you know what? I've sat and listened to them and said, yep, guilty. There were times in my life when... In fact, I can't think of a day in my life when I gave 100% of my energy, my thoughts, my time to the worship of God in heart and deed. How about you? Well, three minutes I was thinking about some sports. Oh, 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 wow. No, we all fall short in the area of time management. But the good news is Jesus died for those who break the law and are not given God their whole heart, soul, mind of strength, even though that is what they are called upon to do. And we rejoice in the law of God because it tells us God's standard. It tells us who God is and what is expected of us, but it also reveals our sin and draws us and drives us to the Savior. I'm convinced that most Christians have not understood the concept of law and gospel. I believe it should be present in every sermon that we hear God's law and we hear of God's remedy for lawbreakers. If all we hear is the remedy, we don't realize we need it. Imagine having the cure for cancer found in five pills. You've got to go around all the neighborhood getting these five pills down people's throats. How do you do that? I've got these great pills. Don't they look good? Would you like one? Would you try five? Uh, well, no. Slam the door. Hey, I don't need it. But if, as a doctor, you get 
the chance to reveal the x-rays that reveal they have a fatal disease called cancer that has a cure in these five pills. This is an analogy, you understand, but you bring them to the point where they say, you know what, uh, really? I've got several months to live only? No, it's actually worse than that. You've got about a month to live, the way this is progressing. But there is good news. What? There is good news? I've got these five pills. Now they're interested. And so many in the church go off with their five pills, five solas. And they say, would you take these? And they say, I don't know if I need them. But we realize we need those five solas because without them we face certain death and certain estrangement before a holy God. And God saves his people by means of grace alone. Oh, thank God, through faith alone. Oh, just trust in him, in Christ alone. Just come to him and not anything or anyone else, not my works, no, all of him. Based on what? Based on scripture alone. Oh, that's all I need? All to the glory of God alone. Now we're interested. The Bible tells us that we've sinned before a holy God and come so far short we can't even see how short we've come. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, everybody sins. Yes, and that's the problem. But God has given Christ to the world as the Savior of the world, the light of the world, the bread of life, all the things we read of in John. Have you come to Him? Have you come to Him on His terms? Rick Phillips writes this, given all that John records concerning Jesus, it is astonishing that people are reluctant to claim him as Savior in Christ. He then quotes Jonathan Edwards. What are you afraid of? That you dare not venture your soul upon Christ? Are you afraid that he cannot save you? That he is not strong enough to conquer the enemies of your soul? Are you afraid that he will not be willing to stoop so low as to take any gracious notice of you? If you are hesitant to trust your salvation to Jesus, then John's witness to his miraculous signs and his many acts of mercy should persuade you that Jesus is all that you could desire in a Savior and more. Edwards answers, What is there that you can desire should be in a Savior that is not in Christ? What excellency is there wanting? What is there that is great or good? What is adorable or endearing? Or what can you think of that would be encouraging which is not to be found in the person of Christ? Rick Phillips goes on, Consider the virtues that we might seek in a Messiah. Are you looking for a Savior who's high and lifted up? Edwards asks, Is not the Son of God a person honorable enough to be worthy that you should be dependent upon him? Is he not a person high enough to be appointed to so honorable a work as your salvation? Rick Phillips goes on, Well, you might ask that a Savior has suffered and gained a fellow feeling with those who are afflicted. Then, to quote Edwards, Has not Christ been made low enough for you? Has he not suffered enough, having borne the wrath of God against our sins? Or, Edwards asks, perhaps you realize that you must have a Savior who's near to God and so able to mediate successfully on your behalf. Edwards, can you desire him to be nearer to God than Christ is, who is his only begotten Son? Again, you might desire the Savior to be near and accessible to you. Edwards, would you not have him nearer to you than to be in the same nature united to you by a spiritual union so close as to be fitly represented by the union of the wife to the husband, of the branch to the vine, of the member to the head. Rick Phillips. Finally, you might demand a Savior to have given some great an extraordinary testimony of mercy and love to sinners by something that he has done. Can you think or conceive, Edwards answers, of greater things than Christ has done? Was it not a great thing for him who was God to take upon himself human nature, to be not only God but man, thenceforward to all eternity? In other words, when he became a man, it was not for a three-decade experience, it was forever. There is a man in heaven 
representing the people of God. But would you look upon suffering for sinners to be a yet greater testimony of love to sinners? And would you desire that a Savior should suffer more than Christ has suffered for sinners? What is there wanting? Or what would you add, if you could, to make him more fit to be your Savior? Rick Phillips, the answer is that given all that John has revealed about Jesus as Son of God and Savior for all who believe, there is nothing more we could ask or desire than what we find in God's Son. Therefore, let us believe in Him, committing our salvation wholly into His mighty pierced hands, knowing that whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Ladies and gentlemen, as we look at this text, these two verses sum up the purpose of the book. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written here, not written in this book, but these are written so that we would be without excuse, so that we would believe, each of us, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Eternal life. Eternal life is life eternal. You can't have it for 10 minutes and it be eternal life. Oh, I had eternal life for a good 18 minutes there. (laughs) Some people think they had it for 18 years and lost it. Once you have it, you'll never lose it. Jesus has never lost a true sheep. Not once. Never has he had to report back to the Father, it's been a bad week, I lost three in Peoria, Arizona. I don't want to talk about Scottsdale. (laughs) And uh, in hearing that, Father, I'm sure you're in a bad mood. You do not want to hear about Alabama. (laughs) No. Because it's the will of God that Jesus does the will of God. And Jesus says, my purpose is to do the will of God. And we know what the will of God is. John 6. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all he has given me, I lose nothing. Have you come? Have you put your faith in Christ? Believe, are you trusting in Christ? Are you believing in Christ? Then believe on. Let these words encourage you in your faith. You're nearer seeing the same Jesus Thomas saw. You're a day nearer than yesterday. We don't know how long it will be that each of us will see him, but every eye will see him. Kings and presidents and those who sleep under freeways and everything in between. Everything in heaven and earth will bow the knee to this King, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory, the Lord of glory. What have you and I done with Him? Come to Him on His terms. Realize the affection of Christ for sinners in His death for you. And see it also in His living for you. Living for all those who would ever believe in Him so that Though they have not kept the law, he did for them. Do you remember when he came to John one time? We read of it in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus wanted to be baptized by John, and John says, hey, that, whoa, this is beyond my pay grade. This is way beyond what I should be doing. I, I, I need to be baptized by you, not the other way around. And Jesus said, look, we haven't got time for theology one on one. The water's cold. Um, just suffice it. Just, just let, I'll explain it later, but in this, we'll fulfill all righteousness. You see, God had sent John the Baptist as God's prophet to the land, and he was calling for a baptism of repentance, and though Jesus had not had any need of repentance, he had never sinned, yet he was being baptized because that was what God was commanding the people to do. And as a representative of the people, he submitted to John's baptism. It was the right thing to do. And that really is a, a few seconds of insight as to the, the methodology of Jesus. I'm here to fulfill the law, not abolish it, not take it away, but to do everything that God has commanded. And that was the righteous life Jesus lived as he went to the cross. He went to the cross as the perfect Lamb of God, without blemish, without spot. Not even his enemies could accuse him of sin rightfully. 
And on the cross, this perfect lamb suffered in our place. The hurls and abuse of the Romans and those around the cross must have been agony for, he, for him to hear. They had no idea what he was doing. Billy Graham once said in a sermon years ago, the crowd said, we will believe in you if you come down, but we believe in him because he stayed up. He hung there for sinners. He took the wrath that we deserved. It's as if the curtain on the whole thing was brought together so the man could not look. The very sky was darkened where God did business with his son as on the cross this perfect lamb submitted to the will of his father in passive obedience, taking and absorbing on himself the wrath due to the people of God. And he fully bore the wrath until God had indicated to him, okay, it's done, you can declare it. And his triumphant cry on the cross, not three days later, on the cross was, Tetelestai, it is finished, I've done it. Then he gave up his spirit and died on his terms. And three days later, just as he said he would, he was raised from the dead. Romans chapter 1 verse 4 says he was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection. This was the Father's way of saying everything Jesus said he was, everything he did, it's all true. Son, up from the grave. And the Holy Spirit, even this very moment, testifies to the truth. Jesus Christ is the Son of God the Christ. Believe in him. Where is he now? On the throne of all thrones. He is the king of all kings. He's not coming back to be crowned king. He's already had the ceremony. He is king now. He's ruling now. What have you done with him? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, how true it is. Many things were left out of John's gospel. But what has been written leaves all of us without any excuse so that we would all be brought by the Holy Spirit to proclaim, my Lord and my God, you are the Christ. You are the Son of God. Show us the Lord Jesus, we pray, each of us. In Christ's name, amen.